Until you know how, playing fast on the piano can seem like a really daunting challenge. Just looking at a page full of black ink is enough to put you off. I, for one, really didn't used to like playing pieces that had lots of fast passages in. But now I enjoy practicing them and I enjoy playing them. And so I thought today we could go through everything that you need to get playing fast on the piano. We can break this really into three main sections. The first one's about movement. This is your foundation of how you play at the piano. The second one's about your practice strategy, knowing what you're going to practice when you sit at the piano. And the third one's really about your mental strategy. How are you going to approach playing something that is quite tricky? And lastly, we're going to go through the secret sauce, which is going to tie everything together and is really going to help with your fast playing. Instead of technique, I've called it movement. And that's because it's the refining of the movement of your hands, your arms, your fingers that's going to allow you to play faster. If there's a particular piece that you're playing at the moment, think about how these four movements can be applied to it. It took me years to figure this one out, and it's often hiding there right in front of you. But it's how independent your fingers are from each other. So I thought we could do a quick challenge and an exercise to see how independent our fingers are and how we can improve our finger independence. So playing fast passages, scales, and even voicing chords, these are all much easier once your fingers are independent. So here's a simple exercise for you to try out to make your fingers a little bit more independent from each other. All right, so when we're doing this exercise, all we need to do is put our hands on the keys, making sure that our wrist is relaxed, and we're kind of lightly on top of the keys here. And all we need to do is play the thumb and then cycle through the other fingers. And then we're going to repeat that, but this time we're going to hold the second finger down. Make sure that your fingers lift after each time that you press the note. Now we'll repeat this, but on the third finger, this one's a little bit more challenging. and then repeat that for the other two as well. So that's kind of how that exercise goes, and that will really help for your fingers to become more independent from each other. The next big movement, or it's kind of actually a little movement, that you really need to consider when you're playing is how your fingers are moving. And that is, they're going down, but are they coming up again? So what we often see is that our fingers will go down, but they're not retracting quick enough to then play the next note. And this is a big problem when it comes to faster playing. But there's a really simple solution. And for me, I find that practicing staccato playing, that pressing down and then lifting up of the finger really helps to get you playing faster. Now, you're not going to play your passage fast, but practicing staccato really helps. Now, if you want to take this one step further, you can think about how you can practice staccato with different finger movements as well. So say you wanted to play a five, a five note little scale like that. There are different ways that you can move your fingers. So you could flick them back, or you could flick them forwards, or you can think about them going vertically downwards. Again, it's retracting your finger after you've played it as well. Ideally, stay as close to the key as you can, and that will help you to build your speed as you're playing. So your fingers are now more independent. They're now moving in a different way. You can apply this to all of your scales, all of your arpeggios. Again, these can be practiced staccato, and that will really help to build in these patterns that you're learning in your scales and arpeggios but also using finger movements while you're doing it. One of the big problems with trying to play fast on the piano is that it's really easy to tense up. The harder and harder you try, the slower and slower you go. So it's really important to get used to practicing relaxation in your muscles when you're playing. One of the biggest places that I see tension coming about is in your wrist. And I want to go through this exercise that allows you to let go of your wrist, use it in a slightly different way perhaps, and that will help you to get it on the move and get it relaxed and playing a little bit faster. So a great exercise for getting your wrist to become a little bit more flexible, a little bit more relaxed, is the first Hannon exercise. And what we're going to think about is, 
as we move through the exercise, we're going to go down and through a shallow bowl. And then as we continue with the exercise, we're going to use another bowl on top of that bowl. I know I'm talking about bowls. This, this is kind of crazy. But we're going to think about another bowl on top of that bowl, and we're going to go over the top of it. Let me show you what I mean. So as you go down and through, your wrist goes down in this bowl shape, and then we're going to go over the top as we continue. So down and through, over the top. Down and through, over the top. As you continue with this exercise, you don't need to move your wrist as much. You get used to moving it up and down and around, but as you continue doing it, try to minimize your movements. Try to make the, the same movement, but smaller as you go. So for instance, We're trying to make the same movement, but smaller. Now that your technique's in place, how do you actually approach the piece that you're playing? Well, that's where your practice strategy comes in. But before we jump into that, if you feel as though your practice isn't as well rounded as it could be, that is, you're not focusing on everything that you should be in a practice session, then the practice routine that I've been using for years can help you to know exactly what to do when you sit down at the piano. It's complete with loads of book recommendations, and you can get it from the link in the description below. So this is a four part practice strategy so that you know exactly what to do when you start your practice. And make sure that before you jump into these that you know your piece hand separately, you know your notes and you know your rhythms. So part one's simple and it's easy as well. It's about practicing slowly, but more importantly than slowly, it's about practicing smoothly. And what I mean by this is connecting all of your notes up in legato, measuring the distance between every note that you're playing. This will lay the foundation for when it comes to playing faster. Part two is really gonna help you with your slow practice, and it's to use the most important tool that you have available to you, and that is the metronome. So when you've got a piece of music, you have a target speed. For instance, at the moment I'm learning a piece which my target speed is 160 BPM. So what I always suggest doing is taking your target speed, 160, divide it by two, which gives you 80. And then sometimes actually I even start at about 60, a little bit slower than this, but this will be your starting point. Now that you've got your starting point, just add five or 10 BPM as you go until you hit a point where it gets really hard. At that point, you can practice just below that and see if you can just push that line a little bit further. Once you've found the line, you'll start to get more comfortable at that speed, especially if you practice in small increments going up from your half speed. And then you'll be able to start pushing that line slowly over time. Part three is about finding other and interesting ways to practice. And one of the ways that I like to do this is to use rhythms. For instance, if you're playing in semiquavers, as I am in my piece, you can use different combinations of semiquavers and quavers, or sixteenth notes and eighth notes, if those are the terms that you use. So, for instance, you can use two semiquavers, a quaver and a quaver, or you could. Uh, swap that round. You could use two quavers and then two semiquavers. Or you could put the semiquavers in the middle. So we'll have a quaver, two semiquavers, and a quaver. You can also do this with your metronome practice. So you can combine it with that to practice those at different speeds. That allows you to cover all of the connections at different speeds as well. There are so many different combinations of rhythms that you can use. You can use triplet rhythms as well, for instance. But just make sure that when you're doing this, you're going over that particular movement that you find hard. Part four is about asking yourself, how else can I practice this? For instance, could you use block chords in your practice? Could you combine it with what you did with your staccato practice earlier? There are so many different options, and in fact, you should combine all of these. So we've covered some really important points about technique and practice strategy, but we really need to talk about how we frame fast music, and that's where your mental strategy comes in. Before we jump into the big takeaway that is the secret sauce, 
consider these four points that are really easy to forget. So the first is problem solving. And for this, you really need to stop playing. Let me explain. So have you ever found yourself repeating the same thing over and over again, but without achieving the outcome that you want? I certainly have. Well, for this, what you really need to do is stop playing and start problem solving. It's to ask yourselves questions like, why can't I play this? What movement would my hand, arm, or fingers need to make to be able to play this? What exercise could I practice today so that I can play this tomorrow or next week or next month? So you've identified the passage you're struggling with, you've asked yourself the problem-solving questions, and you've even worked on the technique. Well, now what? Well, I'd really encourage you to write it down on the score. I can't believe I actually did this recently, but I went through this whole process of problem-solving, working out the technique, practicing it, and then I went to write it down on my score only to, found, only to find that I'd already written it before. That's a mistake that I'm really hopefully only going to make once. The second part of the mental strategy is just to use time. Time to allow you to problem solve, to memorize, to work out and really get to know the piece that you're playing. Sometimes working harder just doesn't work. And what we need to do is actually wait for things to just click. This can be frustrating because it's unpredictable. But time really helps. So allow time in your practice and be patient with your playing. So the next one's all about practice. And I don't just mean practice generally, but I mean practicing fast pieces. The more that you practice fast pieces, the more that you'll develop strategies, techniques that you'll be able to transfer to the other fast pieces that you're playing. So the secret sauce is about combining your mental strategy, your movement, everything that we've talked about today. But it's also to do with changing your perspective. So when it comes to playing fast, oftentimes what we try and do is just play individual notes, but quite fast. Instead, try to group your notes together in movements as much as possible. So for instance, if we take just a five note scale, um, instead of playing them individually with your arm, try to create a movement that goes through and plays multiple notes in one movement. No matter what you're playing, if it's, if it's your hand and exercise, just try and combine your all of your notes into one movement. Whatever it is, try and create one movement out of it. That's now one movement. So creating one movement can help you, help you to develop that speed throughout the passage that you're playing. It's really about thinking about this as fewer units. Instead of many things, we've now only got one thing. And one thing per bar, one thing per phrase, per passage. That will get things moving along much quicker. Something that we haven't touched on in this really technical tutorial is musical expression and shaping. So to balance out your technique with your musicality, be sure to check out this next video. And if you found this valuable, don't forget to subscribe. I'll catch you in the next one.